they identified a very large geometrical chamber about 15 feet beneath the forepaws of the Sphinx. I think there's a lot more remains to be discovered under the Giza plan. He said that the Hall of Records of Atlantis lay beneath the paws of the, of the Great Sphinx. The reasons that I would never seek to divorce the ancient Egyptians from the Great Pyramids are, there are several reasons actually, but first and foremost, I have no doubt that the ancient Egyptians were involved in completing the Great Pyramids, and there's four reasons for that. And that is the shafts, the so-called air shafts, that cut through the body of the Great Pyramid. Uh, they're very small. Um, they're about that wide, that high. There are two of them in the so-called King's Chamber, yeah. one on the north wall, one on the south wall. And they always exited on the outside of the pyramid. And that was known back into the 19th century. You know, 19th century explorers could actually climb the Great Pyramid and roll a cannonball into one of those shafts, and it would end up in the king's chamber. So right. obviously they were connected. The shafts in the so-called queen's chamber, and I use the word so-called because we actually don't know what these chambers were for. No, no burial of any pharaoh was ever found inside the Great Pyramid. Um, the so-called queen's chamber, the shafts don't exit on the outside of the Great Pyramid, and nor until 1872 were they visible within the queen's chamber itself. They'd been closed off with little facing blocks. The, you, you couldn't see that they were there. But one researcher went around tapping on the walls. He thought, there's shafts upstairs in the king's chamber. Maybe there are here. And he found two hollow points, one on the north wall, one on the south wall, broke them open, and lo and behold, there were the concealed shafts. Now, the thing about those shafts is that all four of them point at key stars, one of them being the lowest of the three stars of Orion's belt. In the position in the sky that they occupied around 2,500 BC, not 12,500 years ago, but 4,500 years ago. And that astronomical connection to the stars at that time says to me, we cannot divorce the ancient Egyptians from the Great Pyramid. Uh, but then there's a problem. The ground pattern on the three pyramids on the ground reflects the pattern of Orion's of Orion, belt itself. Yeah. And this is, of course, no accident within the ancient Egyptian system, uh, because the constellation of Orion was seen as the celestial image of the god Osiris. Mm -hmm. the civilization bringer, the entity who went around the world teaching civilization. That is who Osiris is, and he is seen in the sky. His image is seen in the sky as the constellation of, of Orion, and one of those shafts points at Orion's belt, and another one points at, at Sirius, and two of them point at the circumpolar stars. Uh, at the time uh, when Egyptologists believed the pyramids were built. So there's definitely a connection, and I wouldn't seek to break it. But the problem is that the pattern of the three pyramids on the ground is the pattern of the three stars of the belt of Orion. And this has also changed subtly over the ages as a result of precession. So although the shafts in the Great Pyramid lock that monument to the epoch of 2500 BC, the pattern of the pyramids on the ground reflecting Orion's belt, effectively it's like you want to make a painting of Orion's belt. You paint it on an easel and then you lay it down flat in front of you. That's what you have on the Giza Plateau. They reflect the pattern of Orion's belt and its relationship to the Milky Way. The Great Pyramids and their relationship to the River Nile reflect the sky of 12,500 years ago, not wow. 4,500 years ago. A very complicated situation here. Ground pattern, speaking of what the ancient Egyptians called Zeptepi the first time, 12,500 plus years ago, and the star shafts connecting also to the time of the ancient Egyptians themselves. So no wonder it's a difficult monument to figure out, but it speaks to both epochs. We could say that the ancient Egyptians themselves had a sufficiently advanced knowledge of procession to be able to visualize the skies of 8,000 years previously. Uh, that would be a perfectly reasonable thing to say. But uh, then we're confronted with the problem of the Sphinx. I mentioned yeah. that lion-bodied monument. Uh, that, that lion monument that I believe stood there 12,500 years ago looking at the rising sun when it was housed by the constellation of Leo. That lion monument has been subjected to thousands of years of erosion. Um, and I want to pay tribute to the brilliant work of two individuals. The late, great John Anthony West, dear friend of mine, the first to raise the possibility that the Great Sphinx had been subjected to some kind of water weathering. And that creates a problem in itself because 4,500 years ago, the uh, Giza Plateau was as dry uh, and as waterless as, as it is today. And then Professor Robert Schock from Boston University 
And kudos to Robert Schock for putting his reputation as an established academic on the line and looking at the geology of that site and coming to the conclusion and publishing the conclusion uh, that the Great Sphinx was subjected to about 1,000 years of extremely heavy rainfall. Not a flood, but precipitation, rainfall coming from above, selectively hollowing out the softer areas of rock and leaving the harder areas of rock in, in, in place. And it's that precipitation-induced weathering that you see more in the trench around the Great Sphinx now than you see on the Sphinx itself, because the Sphinx has been constantly restored. This is one of the anomalies. We know that some of the restoration blocks were put there in the time of the pharaoh who's supposed to have been responsible for the Sphinx. And not a single document tells us that he was responsible. That's just another Egyptological fantasy, actually. The Great Sphinx was subjected to about a thousand years of heavy rainfall, and that's the only time you find that heavy rainfall on the Giza Plateau is the Younger Dryas between roughly 12,800 and 11,600 years ago. You certainly didn't find it 4,500 years ago when the Sphinx is supposed to have been made. So we're looking at a very old monument, very heavily eroded. In the time of the ancient Egyptians, they looked at that massive Leonine head, which was so damaged and so eroded, almost unrecognizable, and they recarved what was left of it uh, into the head of a human being, wearing the Nemes headdress of an Egyptian pharaoh. That is a recarving of a much more ancient monument. That's that's a restoration work that was done on it. And we don't know who which pharaoh it's supposed to represent. Egyptologists like to think that it represents Khafre. There's no compelling evidence for that what, what's, whatsoever. So a lion-bodied monument, a, once a lion-headed monument, that now takes the form of the lion-bodied Great Sphinx with a recarved human head that's way out of proportion to the scale of the rest of the body of that 270-foot-long uh, monument. The head is sort of tiny by comparison with the rest right. of the body. And the ancient yeah. Egyptians didn't get things out of proportion mm -hmm. unless there was a very good reason to do so. And I think they were restoring a, a very damaged and much older Leonine head. Is there not a hidden chamber as well under the Sphinx? Yes. Um, while work was allowed to be done, John Anthony West and Robert Schock were both involved in this work back in 1992. Uh, they did um, a seismic survey around the Sphinx and they identified a very large a geometrical chamber about 15 feet uh, beneath the forepaws of the Sphinx. Could be a natural cavity, but the geometrical, the rectangular form of it suggests strongly that human beings were Was involved. dug out or something. Yeah, yeah, that it was made. And in fact, there is a whole underworld at Giza. This is beginning to be recognized. The so-called Tomb of Osiris is an example of this. That subterranean chamber beneath the Great Pyramid is an example of this. There's I think there's a lot more remains to be discovered under the Giza Plateau. What right. is needed is seismic tomography, and uh, that will show you a picture of what is of what is underneath the Giza Plateau. And whenever that's been done, it's identified chambers, passageways, corridors, um, and not enough is being said about this. I think they're just so locked into their paradigm that they, they can't see what's They feel like they fi they've got it figured out. They've got they it figured no, out. No reason to waste resources. Exactly. No reason to waste the resources, and they don't want to get mixed up in any way with this crowd of kind of quote-unquote new age thinkers like Graham Hancock. <laughs> Edgar Casey was a healer. He used to fall into a trance-like state. And in that trance-like state, primarily what he did was offer remedies for people's ailments. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, but from time to time, he would start talking about Atlantis and about a lost civilization of prehistoric antiquity. Um, and he said that the Hall of Records of Atlantis lay beneath the paws of the, of the Great Sphinx. Well, immediately for, for, for scientifically minded Egyptologists, this is something to get as far away from as possible. Right. Yeah. So they kind of neglect the fact that there are ancient Egyptian texts that speak precisely of that precisely of a hall of record. Edward Casey didn't know about those texts. That's he was tapping thing. in from, from some other realm into this. But that's one of the reasons that Egyptologists have distanced themselves so much from the notion that there might be something hidden there. Oddly enough, both Mark Lehner, who is the leading American Egyptologist um, doing work around the Great Sphinx and on the Giza Plateau, and Zahi Hawass, who's the leading Egyptian Egyptologist doing work around the Giza Plateau. Both of them were sent through college by the Edgar Casey Foundation. Wow. Robert Baval and I published this in our 1996 book, 
The Message of the Sphinx. It was published in, in America as The Message of the Sphinx and in Britain as Keeper of Genesis. And we documented it. It's all there if anybody wants to check it out. Very rapidly afterwards, they distanced themselves completely yeah. from the Edgar Casey organization. But until quite recently, Zahir Was was still giving lectures at the Edgar Casey Foundation. While at the same time, <laughs> insisting that he had nothing to do with any of these so-called crazy ideas. Please engage with this video by liking, commenting, and sharing. Subscribe to stay updated. For more amazing content, check out our next video.